when you have so many people behind you pushing you, you know. So, um, so in closing, I guess when when uh, people come up to me every every day, because it, it is pretty much every day, someone will stop up and say, you know, thank you for your service, thank you for for what you've done and stuff. Um, I appreciate that; it means a lot. But it's really um, the people of this state and this community that make this the best place to live, the best country there is on the planet. It's all of you guys and all of the people of this, this area that make it worth fighting for and make it worth all of us raising our hand and going over there and doing it. And we would do it again. If I had to go back and re-enlist, do it all over again, knowing what would happen, uh, strangely, I would do it again. And strangely, after all of this, um, I'm happier than I've ever been in my entire life. And it's because I, I appreciate life now. So um, so thank you guys for having me out today. I'd be more than happy to answer questions. You got the Cliff Notes version in the talk. Um, the book, uh, Jim and I, I was at a speaking event in 2008 and uh, met Jim Cosmo there. It was to raise money for the Boy Scouts. So yesterday I ended up lying on accident. They asked if I ever spoke to Boy Scouts before. And I said no, but <laughs> oops, wasn't on purpose. Um, we met there, and he came out uh, to the parking lot. He walked me out to the parking lot, and he said, it's quite the story. He said, have you ever thought of writing a book? And I was like, well, I kept a journal sometimes in the hospital just so when my kids are older, they can look back and sort of see what Dad went through. Um, but we agreed then to, to put it in a book, and, and it took two years to make sure it was thorough, it was accurate, and it was respectful of the guys that I served with and the guys that gave their life over there. And uh, that's why it took so long. But the, the final product, this brings you through in the first person. All of the, you know, what it was like to go through what I did. And then the eight days in the coma, uh, Jim did a great job writing it. That's when we lost the voice because I it can't be in the first person when I'm in a coma. So he had the great idea of talking to my wife, having her describe the time when I was in a coma, her trip to Germany and all of that and then my guys that were on the ground. Uh, this is Jim Cosmo. He is the author of the book. He is the as told to. Um, <laughs> did a, a magnificent job. And, uh, you know, at first, when he came up and wanted to write my book, you know, I was skeptical at first. I'm like, who is this guy? What is, is he just trying to make money off me or what? You know, like, you always wonder. But getting to work with him and working with him for the, for the two years, we became very close, and he's... I mean, he's family now. I put him right there with uh, with the guys I served with, and uh, love the guy. And uh, well, he wasn't able to make it to my birthday party. <laughs> was that all about? My wife threw me a ridiculous surprise party where I turned 30 on the seventh, and she tricked the heck out of me and completely got me. And it was a bunch of my army buddies and stuff. But Jim was out of town; he couldn't make it. But I'll have him talk a little bit about the process of writing the book, and uh, he did a great job. Thank you. It was really a, a great pleasure to have that opportunity. And as John said, uh, me and a couple other fellows at Rotary were out raising money for Boy Scouts. And uh, this guy came, uh, Bill Derrick, who was one of the other guys, is a home builder and had helped uh, John by putting building on a home that he could move around in easily. And it's quite a nice place. But uh, he said, I got the perfect guy to speak. Uh, uh, this, uh, he just came back from Iraq and is injured. And, well, so one thing led to another. We got done there. And you got to bear in mind, uh, years ago I was a newspaper writer and a newspaper editor and had a pretty good career in the newspaper. But then I went into the Sant family business and I owned the Paddleford Riverboats in St. Paul now. And so for the past 30 years I've been running riverboats in a small business. And so I'm not quite sure what got into me that day, but I'm sitting there listening to John talk and I got as inspired as everyone does. So I went up to him afterwards and asked him about writing why he hasn't written a book about this. And he said, well, it's just a little problem here. I've got all the material stuff. I just, I can't write. And somewhere, something inside me said, I can, I can do that. Well, <laughs> I can, I can write just now. Well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, he writes. Okay, not, not too much. <laughs> <really. laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but uh, and he had a lot of stuff in it. Was so we we met frequently, and uh, 
it was a, it was a story that almost wrote itself. But we got about got a, got a few months into it, and uh, I'm writing it like a like a traditional book. And suddenly, I'm listening to the uh, the recordings that I had done with John. I said, "Damn, this story needs to be written first person, present tense, so you can kind of get the feeling and go along with it, just like the just like these recordings that I've got." So. Uh, so that I changed directions, and that's what we started doing, writing it in his voice. And as John pointed out, there was eight days, probably the most important eight days in the story, where he was unconscious and not, not, not being real smart or not looking ahead. I forgot about that. Then I get to those eight days, and suddenly my voice is totally silent. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? But that's, it seemed like a huge problem. But, uh, and the answer seems simple now when you look back on it, but at the time, we wrestled with this for a couple of days, and then I got one of these middle of the night things. You ever wake up in the middle of the night with this brilliant idea, and then you think, I hope this sounds as good at 8 o'clock as it does at 2? <laughs> but, uh, and that was simply to have the people who were with him, and as John mentioned, there was somebody who just happened to be at each of the hospitals that he was at. And uh, so I, it gave us the opportunity to introduce those people and uh, he talked a little bit about Katie, but uh, as remarkable a person as John is, he's probably number two in that family. Katie is, is just a phenomenal young lady. She, you ask about her, the accommodations, they gave her a nicer chair. At first she had a metal chair, a metal folding chair in the first uh, waiting area. Then they gave her a, a nicer chair, which was kind of comfortable. She literally lived in that chair. 24 hours a day for about five months while he was in the hospital, hospital until he moved into the thing, and um, maybe went out to grab a quick bite to eat or something once in a while down on the downstairs. But uh, almost all the time was in there, and you know, taking care of his every need and pushing him, and uh, and then and, and her parents watched the two boys and brought them into town once in a while. But it was. Uh, uh, it, it, it just a, an amazing couple, so it, it made a great joy to me to be able to tell this story to people. And our objective is we got into it, John and I sat down and we said, okay, this is, a, this is a great story about, you know, what you've done and all things that have happened, but it's got to have a message and it's got to be a positive message. And I think having listened to John, uh, many of you have probably read uh, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale's book on the power of positive thinking. Well, believe me, if he were alive today, he'd have to add another chapter and call it John Creasel, because this is the most positive guy I've ever ever had the opportunity to meet. And I challenge anyone to be around him and complain about anything. It just, <laughs> it just, it's just not possible. But uh, we, we've had a, a great time going out talking to people. We, um, you ask about young people, that's, I think, where John really shines. Uh, we talked to a group in Stillwater, uh, Tozier Gra uh, Foundation gives scholarships every year. They give about four or five hundred scholarships. And so we met with 150 of those top students from all around Minnesota. And after John got done talking, it was more than two hours the kids stood there waiting to talk to him about uh, on a personal basis. And that's one of the problems we get into when we're, when we're selling books. I can't get him to move along. He wants to talk to everybody individually. <laughs> and uh, last night we were at in Apple Valley at a, at a Cub Scout meeting, and there was kids from kindergarten through 12th grade there. And afterward, the the scout leader, the area scout leader, came up and said, "Wow, you kept kindergartners captivated for a half an hour. We can't keep them contained for five minutes." And these kids, they were, they were just sitting there with their jaws hanging down and, and uh, really listened to everywhere. The interesting thing was, as we found out, they all play, what's, what's the game? Call of Duty. Call of Duty, uh, the, uh, video the video game. They know more about weaponry than, than John does. <laughs> it was just amazing. I mean, it was most of the weapons on that game, but they know everything about it. Yeah, yeah, so, but anyway, that's uh, uh, a long answer to your, to your story. But thank you for having us here today.